name is Dan Brown and I'm here today again with another Lenses on Information Architecture conversation. And today I get to talk to, it turns out, my neighbor, Joe Natoli. <laughs> Joe, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, it's, I'm glad we're uh, finally getting a chance uh, to chat. I've followed you on Twitter for ages and um, uh, I love how dedicated you are to educating uh, user experience folks uh, and this uh, and uh, raising the next generation of, of designers, shall we say. Can you talk to me a little bit about um, what do you think uh, you, when, you, when you interact with your students, what is their biggest surprise? What is the thing that, they, that surprises them the most about this field? What is the thing that they sort of have to learn that they least expect? I think quite honestly, I think there is a massive disconnect and this usually comes back to me um, when they've just started to enter the job market. I think there are two things that shock the hell out of them. Number one, what it really takes to even get an interview. Okay, all these hoops that have to be jumped through to even get somebody to reply <laughs> to an email or acknowledge your existence. And the other big giant shock, the bigger one, the one I spend the most time with, um, with young UXers and designers of all stripes, is that when they get into an organization and they come in, like probably a lot of us did, with all their, their processes, right? And methods and formalities. And this is the way that UX is supposed to work. And we have a mission of making everything better for everybody. And they find out that a lot of that perfect world stuff as perfectly ordered and wonderful as it sounds on paper, including agile and lean and everything else, how it's actually practiced inside the walls of an organization with people and emotions and politics and messiness <laughs> is very, very different. And they run into a wall. I think in some ways, education systems of all kinds, including boot camps, okay, not just universities, miss at least 40% of what I think younger folks or en people entering this profession really need to understand about the mechanics of working inside a company, whether it's a startup or a growth stage company or an enterprise or whatever, there's a whole lot that impacts decision-making that has nothing to do with good UX or good design, right? I mean, it, it's just a massive culture shock. I spend a lot of time helping people work through that. What, what do you think is, uh, what's kind of the best technique or what, what's kind of a, a technique that's at least worked for you to kind of help at least maybe open their eyes a little bit to this understanding of how much design is wrapped up with the um, uh, political dynamics of decision-making in yeah. an organization. Yeah, well, part of that, to be honest with you, is kind of always the same. And that, that always starts for me with seeing the other side, okay? And getting them to see the part that they're not seeing. In, in that a lot of times, it's easy to say, well, you know, these people are barbarians. They don't care about doing things the right way. They don't care about, Users, they don't care about anything. Sometimes that's true, all right? There are toxic people everywhere and that happens. But a lot of times it has everything to do with intent and motivation. The reason you're getting pushback, the reason there's an obstacle to you saying, I need a week to do user research is almost always motivated by some external force that, that you're not aware is happening. Sometimes it's fear, okay? You know, something like with user research, for example. I mean, sometimes the reason, you know this as well as I do, that, that lots of folks from managers on up to executive level people, the reason they're afraid of research is because it's going to confirm something that they already know is happening, but that they really don't want to have to deal with, <laughs> you know, because they've been avoiding it for six months. Um, it, it's that kind of thing. And sometimes it's just a matter of focus. I had a conversation with somebody two days ago who works in a startup. And they're like, they only care about putting on a pretty face, you know, for these, these uh, VC meetings and investor meetings. And, and we can't even develop half of this stuff. We don't even know how we're going to do this. And I told him, I said, look at that statement. Okay, listen to what you just told me. What do they care about? They care about that VC meeting. Why? Because they've got a finite amount of road before they can find a fit and a market for this product, right? And they're running out of time, which means they're also running out of money. The only way you get more time is with more money. <laughs> so if you think anything else is more important than them right now, it isn't. But no, again, no one's taught explicitly to sort of look at those things. So whenever somebody pushes back on something, the first thing I tell people is you need to find out why. You need to find out what's behind that. What are you afraid is going to happen if we do this? 
what's the consequence of, of going ahead and, and doing this? How does it impact your world? And you ask it from a legitimate perspective where you want to know what the other person is concerned about. Once you do that, you have a very different conversa conversation most of the times, right? Because they understand that you're not just preaching your gospel and you believe everyone else should just follow along because they should. You're saying, I care about what you care about. Tell me what that is. Um, that's great. I, I'm really curious about um, uh, the teaching of information architecture and maybe um, uh, obviously I've, I've got to focus on IA and I'm sort of mm -hmm. genuinely curious about how are people learning IA these days <laughs> or not. Um, and uh, I think we'll get to uh, why I think there, this is problematic a little bit later, but I'm, I'm curious, what role does IA play in the work that you're doing, either in consulting or education? How do you fit that in? I think it's everything. I think it's everything. From the very first time I was exposed to IA early in my, in my career, to me, this was like, this was a linchpin moment, okay? I also grew up being an avid reader and avid writer. I still am. Language to me, to design, from the time I learned graphic design back in the 80s, was integral. All right, language and the understanding of it and, in, and just in terms of uh, context, right? Organization, priority, volume, all these things are, are to me what make or break any kind of outward product experience. It is all about content. Even if it's just data, it's still content. All right, so the, the, some of the issue right now, I think, is that it's not integrated as much as it used to be. So a lot of times I find myself, what I think is second nature to a lot of the folks that I'm sitting with on clients' teams, with students, um, with you know, folks who are new to this, whatever, they kind of don't know in the same way to look at it, where they'll describe a problem to me, right? And they'll say, well, we're, we're learning. We did some user research and we're learning. People have issues with this, 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 and this. And I'll say, well, that sounds like an information problem to me. And they say, what do you mean? This content is all, this data is all what we're supposed to be serving. It, it's what they want. So they get that. But what you're calling it, <laughs> maybe throwing them off. The, the relationships that you are suggesting between it may be throwing people off. Where they expect to find it and what they expect it to be called may be throwing them off. So instead of me going down the path of, well, here's the discipline of information architecture you need to think about, I'm trying to break it down in more practical terms and sort of back them into the idea that they need to spend time digging through this stuff it's never going to be an explicit piece of a, of a project in most cases I, I don't know why that is but it just is right companies are like well that's that's fluffy it's extra like, well it isn't so i have to back them into it and sort of teach them to consider these things and be thinking about those things from the very early stages of a product when they start figuring out okay what goes on this screen and those very first little mvp throwaways if it's just developers Okay, I've worked with plenty of companies who are just developers. There are no designers. What are you doing with that content? What is it? <laughs> what is it? Where is it coming from? And is it appropriate? Right? Does it match the context of, of a person's use? Is it what they expect? Is it what they need? They, they're not taught to ask these questions. Uh, I like how you frame that. They're not taught to ask these questions. So now we're going to ask a question that maybe we haven't asked Maybe we're, we're, we're starting to ask it more. Let me put it like that. And I think, I, agree. I think that question is, what, what are some of the uh, preconceptions about uh, user experience? What are some of the assumptions that we have long held? What is some of the conventional wisdom that we have long held that we need to call into question? Uh, I, think, I think it's time for us. I think there's an opportunity, let me put it like that, um, to uh, take a new lens, as I like to put it, to uh, user experience uh, even more broadly. And I, I'm, I'm wondering, is there one aspect, uh, or can you share with us one aspect of user experience that you think needs to be examined more closely? Oh my God, there are many. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, like there's a list and there's a running list in my head right now. And I'm right. going, okay, which one do I pick? Um, in general, I, I'll, let me try to let me try to go here. I think, I think that there is a dogma problem in UX. I think it's massive, and I think it's widespread. And I think that different people have very different attachments to different parts of UX in insistence that it is the entire thing. 
such as we're, we were talking about IA a minute ago. Okay. I think it's a mistake to approach UX without including some element of information architecture work. I don't give a shit what you call it. You have to do it. <laughs> right. So to say, well, UX is only this drives me absolutely insane. And, and the problem, I think the bigger problem we have is companies call it different things. Companies understand it as different things. Practitioners, therefore, especially when they're new, come to understand it as different things. Job listings for UX include programming. I mean, <laughs> like, man, come on. So we have a perception, we have a longstanding perception problem. And I think a lot of that comes from this dogmatic approach to UX is this, and it is not this. It was never that. From the days we were talking about experience design in general, okay, interaction design, it was, it's all this. You have to consider all these things. It's just like the distinction between, I read something about somebody called a business designer the other day. And I went, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> If you're working to make a product better, you can't ever just care about the user side. You have to understand business motivations. You have to understand stakeholders. You have to be looking at information now. Can you be an expert at all those things? No, absolutely not possible. But you can absolutely advocate for that work. You can advocate for people in roles to do that work. And I don't think enough people at the level um, who have the influence to do <clears throat> such things do that. I think we just kind of roll along and we keep creating methodologies to make up for these deficiencies. <laughs> right? Right. What, and, what kind of, what deficiencies did you, did you mean? A lack of understanding, a lack of reaching across the aisle. Like for instance, right, right, right. the whole ops movement to me was born out of deficiency. Now I'm a fan. I think it's a great, I think it's a fantastic idea. I think it's unfortunate that we had to give it its own name, um, but I totally understand it. I totally get it, but it solves a lot of issues where to me, UX and design folks should have been working in these areas and working in these directions and pushing for these things well before it became a name. I hate the fact where, again, I'm going back to IA because it's in my brain. Now it's your fault. <laughs> We started out, we, we had a point in time where IA was a discipline. It was seen as this is a critical component of developing anything that is going to be useful to people and useful and profitable in any number of ways to a business, right? To users, to internal users, to making money or saving money, I don't care. And somehow, I, I should, probably shouldn't say this, it's a loaded statement, but I think by and large, we allowed companies corporations, business, to subsume that and say, ah, we're not paying for all that fluffy stuff. We're going to do this. And if we fought back, we didn't do it in a way where we were speaking their language. Too much of the time we were speaking ours. So the so, arguments fell on deaf ears. Right. Um, I like I like where you're going uh, with this in terms of um, uh, this idea that, that we've got a dogma uh problem i like that a lot and i like and i feel like i can see that in lots of different ways now that i'm looking at user experience through that lens mm -hmm. i can see that in lots of different ways i think it comes out and i've seen it mostly come out with um methodology right there's one way to do yes. uh, ux yeah and that's always like you it's it's always rubbed me the wrong way uh a little bit like why why do we have to make a toolbox a certain size? We could just make a bigger toolbox and it's like, <laughs> kind of like, and you know, and then we have more ways to deal with it. But the other thing that you made me think of is the, the dogma problem is also in this notion that um, UX is, there's sort of a savior complex, right? That UX can, can fix everything. Absolutely. And, and I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, have you witnessed that as well? Of course, of course. And I think we need to get over ourselves. Mm. I mean, you know, I mean, I've always, I've always felt that way. I feel that way now. I, it's a conversation I have routinely with folks, especially when they're getting pushback. Mm. When I dig into why they're getting pushback, mm. again, there are situations where the person on the other side or the team on the other side, in some cases, is toxic or set in its ways. 
and it's an immovable object that is not going to change. And that's one thing that is right. a very specific problem. And that does happen. Right. However, I will tell you, Dan, it, there are more instances where it has everything to do with the way the people on the UX and design side of the fence are presenting their case mm -hmm. as I am going to educate you. Okay. Which is the equivalent of I am on this enlightened pedestal up here and I know these things and I have the secrets to the universe and you do not. So therefore you must learn to me and from me and you must come around to my way of thinking. Sometimes that's intentional. Sometimes it's not, but it is most definitely what happens. <laughs> and it is most definitely what I spend a great deal of time trying to undo right down to the words people use that come out of their mouths. And this is a hard question I'm about to ask, but it's it, all right. Where do we, where do we think that came from? I know where I, well, I shouldn't say that. That's a, it's a, you know where it came from. Egotistical statement. I, I know it's just it you and me. You can tell me. <laughs> it, com it comes from, it comes from feeling marginalized. It comes from being ignored. It comes from uh, being in a profession that by and large, no much, no matter how much lip service is given to it, I still don't think it's respected to the degree that other professions are. In most organizations, you'll find lots of people who think they can do what you do. In other professions, you don't see as much of that. From, from the time I was a graphic designer, okay, mm. there was, I mean, everybody is going to second guess visual decisions because they're like, well, I know what I like and what I don't like. And I think a lot of this is, is an extension of that. I think part of the reason we get on our platforms and we create these convoluted diagrams that no one but us gives a shit about and use all these jar these this jargon and this terminology and, and write these scholarly sounding things that again, the people who really need to absorb it are snoozing out three fucking seconds in. I think the reason we do it is because we're saying, look, we know what we're talking about. It's a bid for legitimacy. You know, it's a bid to say, look respect us <laughs> that's how i see it i could be wrong and it, and it ends up having the opposite effect where exactly um, it, we get sort of get pushed further away um that's right because uh we create um these opaque or inaccessible uh approaches and uh diagrams and what have you and all of a sudden people are like well why should i engage with them they're not getting the work done or the work that i think should be getting Done. And they're giving me all this work I have to do. Right. Okay. Artifacts. <laughs> yeah. My artifacts. I mean, I, I can't remember who, who was. I'm totally forgetting the, the guy's name, which is a shame. Um, but he gave a talk at a conference I was at, and it was called, it was about UX. It was about lean UX. And the, the subtitle was getting out of the deliverables business. Right. Yeah. And he talked a lot about artifacts. Okay. And I still see this where teams will say to me, we're producing, here's our, here's our research report, and it's this thick. Here's a, this customer journey map that we created that takes up an entire wall. Right. And it's clean, it's easy to understand. It's not, none of it is difficult to understand, but no one has the time to sit down with it and digest it and, and give it the careful thought and consideration that we are asking for. Right. You're asking for something that doesn't exist is not going to exist. Right. Yeah, I, I, I remember that. Um, and I, I remember uh, how it rubbed me the wrong way, largely because my first book was all about writing deliverables. And so mm -hmm. I was like, well, but, um, but wait, uh, yeah. wait a minute. Yeah. Um, Why and, are you doing it too? <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm, I've come to realize that um, the deliverable for us, for people like us, is the meeting which yes. I know sounds maybe counterintuitive, but it's absolutely accurate. I love what I love these days. And what we talk a lot about at eight shapes is how are we going to structure this conversation? How are we going to make this conversation meaningful so that other people can absorb right. uh, and take in and contr meaningfully contribute right. um, to this conversation that we're having? I totally agree. I mean, to me, every meeting is a working meeting, right? Right. You know, there's I mean, no, let's just sit around and, and, volley information back and forth right <laughs> i mean the, we're working here at some point we're gonna someone's gonna say well we need to get out of the meetings business and then i'm just gonna be like okay, <laughs> well then we'll be retired time for dan to retire now. i think yeah. <laughs> so 
I wonder if you can help me. Uh, so I've been looking at IA or trying to look at IA and maybe unpack some of the preconceptions that I have. And I realize now you may be the perfect person to help me unpack this preconception that I have. I have this um, um, worry that the students coming out of boot camps uh, and even other kind of design programs don't have the exposure to information architecture like they have to other aspects of the field of user experience. Mm -hmm. um, and my assumption, here's my assumption, and that may be a fact. I feel like that's a fact, right? That, that I'm seeing a lot of, but the assumption is that the that IA is being left out of boot camps and left out of education programs because it's hard and it's complicated and it deals with very abstract things that are difficult to teach. Uh, I wonder if you could help me kind of unpack that. Is it reasonable to call this conventional wisdom that I have about, or this assumption that I have about IA into question? I think personally, <clears throat> I think you're right on target. I think you're hundred percent on target. I think, I think it goes back to the same issue I was talking about when I was talking about dogma. Okay. It has everything to do with how it's perceived, number one. And then number two, when it is taught, when it is disseminated, when it is put forward, um, has everything to do with how it's disseminated. You know as well as I do that there are some fantastic books, for example, <laughs> on information architecture, right? We know these things. We know they exist. Is anybody going to, to invest the time and the effort to teach that properly alongside all the stuff that they are cramming into, let's take boot camps, for example, into a 12-week boot camp. Is it really going to get the attention it deserves? No. Does it have to be that way? No. I think it's a matter of, of taking a different approach. Okay. I think it's a matter of, of summarizing, summing up, taking out the most critical parts and not ignoring everything else, but but teaching it in a way uh, where it's a lot more palatable. For I'll give you, this is probably not a good example, but I'll give you an example. I think it's um, Abby Covert is her name. She wrote a book called Making Sense of Any Mess. Loved it. Okay? It's fantastic. Loved it. right. And the reason I loved it is because it meets people right where they are. There's no, like the, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? The formality that exists around, that can exist around IA, around taxonomy, around uh, all these things, right? It, these are big, deep, clinical in some ways, for lack of a better term, subjects, right? You can get lost in those details. I don't think anyone has the time for that. I don't think that, that people these days with the advent of 240 characters <laughs> um, have the patience. I mean, my kids can't do one thing without doing three other things at the same time. It's not possible. <laughs> For example, I can't do that. I don't have the ability to do that because I'm older. But my point is, I, I think that the entire way that this all comes forward has to change pretty radically. You know, and I have friends who are in, um, who do IA work, you know, like, Peter Morville is one of my favorite people in the world. Jorge Arango is, is one of my favorite people in the world. And if you read these guys' work, it's deep and it's complex and it's damn solid, right? There's an entire lifetime education in some of these publications. But no one's got the time for it. Yeah, and I think that's what's great about Abby's work is, uh, is that uh, that book and the other things that, that she's doing are really trying to um, bring IA down to a place, and I, I don't mean to imply a value judgment there, but no, bring no, it down no, to a place to make it as accessible as as possible. As you were talking, I had I, another theory occurred to me. Okay, and that is that maybe this is. I mean, uh, as you said before, like we were trying to make ourselves feel important. So by saying to myself, "Well, IA is hard," that's obviously why they're not teaching it right because it's really hard and it's complicated and uh they can't squeeze it into these boot camp type things so clearly i'm a smart per yes i agree and maybe there's uh it's not understood 
in the world. So there's no demand for it. Uh, so there's demand for producing a lot of screens real fast, which really good point. folks coming out of boot camp can really do. Good point. But there's not a lot of demand for sitting and staring at a spreadsheet for a while. I mean, there is demand for that, but people don't know that there's demand for that until they have a better understanding of the categorization scheme or whatever. It's not a recognized problem. Right. The problem isn't always recognized as such. Remember what I said a minute ago about talking to teams like, hey, this is an information problem. I mean, that happens more than you think. They're not, they're not, people don't realize that that is the crux of the issue and that that is where your effort needs to go in solving the problem. It's not more, more UI design work, right? It's not more, more, more prototyping and more validating in a, a quicker, agile or lean cycle of iteration, you know, test, improve, repeat, test, improve, repeat. It's not about that. It's about focusing on the right things to begin with. <laughs> what is the nature of this beast? That's a, here's a question I ask constantly to every team I've ever worked with. Job one, what is worth doing here in the first place? I understand we got all these things that we think are important. Which are really important? Which are really problems? Which are cases of really bad, really often? <laughs> and a lot of times those are thorny things like information. It's IA, but it's IA as it manifests itself in interaction and user interface design. It's IA as it manifests in a poor experience where people can't figure out what this means to them <laughs> or how it's relevant or that this content in this area is actually what they're looking for, but they don't realize that that's what it's looking for or that it even exists. Those are bigger, hairier problems to your point. And I think to, to what you're saying, it's like, it's not recognized that that's where the issue is. We're gonna continue to throw tactical stuff at it because <laughs> we think that's the way to solve every problem and it isn't and joe i think we will leave it there thank you so much for joining me thank you very much for having me enjoyed every minute